Hi, this is Kevin Trainer, and welcome to my lecture on Chapter 9 of Morocco's third edition MySQL book. Chapter 9 is about how to use functions. And like uh, a couple of other previous uh, chapters that we had, uh, uh, I think chapters uh, 5 and 6, there's new content in uh, Chapter 9 that uh, reflects uh, new capabilities that uh, arrived in MySQL 8, okay? And so we're going to take the same approach uh, as we did for those uh, chapters. We're going to uh, divide the lecture into parts one and two. And parts one, part one is going to have uh, the uh, continuing uh, content. You could call it the old uh, content, but it, it's current. Okay. And part two, it's going to be the new content, which is uh, mm, conveniently at the end of the chapter. Okay. So this is recording for uh, part one. And when you're done, uh, please play the recording for uh, part two. Okay, how to use functions. Let's get started. So, uh, as usual, I'm going to leave the objectives for you to read on your own. Okay. Now, um, I want to point out here that uh, w the chapter is called How to Use Functions. We've been using functions since, well, certainly chapter 3. We've been using uh, functions for a long time. We haven't had a uh, we haven't had a chapter on functions alone. Okay, so in chapter uh, nine, what we're going to do is we're going to review the functions available in MySQL uh, more in a more encyclopedic way. Okay, we're going to cover. Uh, perhaps not all of them, but a lot of them, and we're going to uh, categorize them as we do. Um, but some of these you've already seen, and, and, seen, and, and the general uh, principles um, you probably already understand. So what are we going to talk about first? Well, the string-related functions, um, for a couple of reasons. One is I think they're the easiest to understand. Uh, two is they probably get the most use. So uh, here's a list of the string functions that are going to be uh, talked about. Uh, concat, ltrim, rtrim, trim, length, locate, left, right, substring, index, and substring. Okay, so that'll keep us pretty busy. And then some more string-related functions. Replace, insert, reverse, lower, upper, LPAD, RPAD, space, and repeat. So, again, a lot of stuff. So let's uh, start look at some examples of using these. Uh, concat we've used uh, for a number of chapters. That's the way we paste uh, together strings. And you'll remember that the examples in the book typically work with string literals, so we can see how they work. More typically, at least one of the uh, the fields that you would be using in the function would be a column name or some expression that was uh, derived from a column name because, uh, you know, typically we don't want to provide literal values uh, in the columns. We want to we want uh, values that are derived from the values that are stored in the columns for uh, the row that we're currently on. So uh, with that little bit of dramatic license, you can see if we uh, if concat last and first, we get last first. Okay, so that's not a, it's not a very, uh, attractive result string, but um, we've done that just to contrast it with the next one. There's a concat underscore 
WS, and uh, WS uh, stands for uh, white space, I think. And what we do is uh, we provide a string that uh, will, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I always, always get this wrong. It's with separator, not white space. Uh, I... <laughs> Uh, I've had that wrong for a lot of years with separator because uh, we're going to uh, separate with a comma and a space. And of course, uh, the space would be white space, but the comma wouldn't be white space. It would be a, a separator. So the first string is the separator string, comma, space. And then we have last and first. So we get last, comma, space, first, okay. Now, what's really good about this is that you can give a whole list of strings and this separator will be inserted in between the first and the second and then the second and the third and the third and the fourth. So it's a real uh, general solution, pretty good stuff. Okay, let's talk about the trims. L trim will trim um, a space off the left side of a string value, okay? Um, it's not typical that we'll get uh, values in columns that need to be trimmed on the left side, but uh, if in fact we had that use case, if we did an L trim of my SQL with spaces before and after, uh, it would trim the spaces off the left side and leave the ones on the right side. Um, by contrast, if we did an R trim for right trim, it would do the opposite. So it would leave spaces on the left side and trim them off the right side. Uh, trim trims left and right. So uh, the result is we just get my SQL with no leading or trailing spaces, which is pretty good. Um, the trim uh, can have more uh, kind of arguments that go in the parens. So there's a keyword both uh, in which we're telling it to trim from both uh, sides. Then there's a character that we're trimming off. In the example that we have here, we're trimming off asterisks. But um, uh, uh, again, uh, we can choose whatever we want. Uh, we've got the from uh, keyword. And then the string that we have here, instead of being uh, padded on the left and the right with spaces, it's padded on the left and the right with asterisks. So the result is just my SQL. Uh, the next one, lower and upper, okay? So uh, we can shift any string to all lowercase by calling lower with access to that string. And of course we get the lowercase version. And uh, likewise, we can shift any string to all uppercase by uh, calling upper. And you can see how now we have an uppercase CA. Um, there are times when we just want the left part or the right part of a string. So we want a substring, okay, that starts from the left or a substring that starts from the right. So if we say left, my sequel and then three, we'll get the left three characters of my sequel. And if we say right my sequel in three, we'll get the th uh, the right three characters of uh, my sequel. And one of the things I really like about left and right is they're so easy to understand what they do. There are more general um, substring uh, functions with which you can do the same things, but um, they're not really as good in terms of uh, uh, documentation. 
when you read this, it's pretty clear that you're trying to get the left part of the string or the right. So these are uh, kind of on my favorites uh, list. Okay. Okay, some more examples. So uh, the, the substring is a way to extract a substring that's more uh, uh, general. So the first argument is uh, either the, the string or the name of the column containing a string. Um, seven, which is the second argument here, is where the string begins. Uh, and eight is how many characters you want. Now, uh, one of the things I really like about SQL is that the uh, the numbers that you give for character uh, positions begin with one, okay? Which is kind of old school, okay? Uh, um, computer programming languages of uh, my youth, like uh, COBOL and uh, PL1, uh, we always uh, counted uh, characters uh, beginning with one. Uh, those of you who have had our programming course, uh, in which you've learned, say, uh, Python, or maybe have worked with Java or JavaScript, will know that more modern programming languages begin to count their characters with uh, uh, zero, okay? And, um, of course, the uh, proponents of counting with zero uh, have all kinds of great reasons why that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> I've never been convinced, to tell you the truth. But this is more old style. We begin with one, uh, and I really like the way this uh, works, so I recommend it highly. So uh, let's see, we want a substring that begins in seven and is eight characters long. So let's look, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the first is the five and five, 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 and then we want eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we get five, 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 one, two, one, two. Uh, so this, uh, the way that they define the arguments uh, two and three here, I think are very straightforward, <laughs> okay? And I highly recommend uh, the, the uh, substring. Um, so we've got that substring index. Okay, how does that work? Well, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with a substring and we're trying to tell it where to start, okay? By default, okay, the easiest way to think of this is it starts on the left, okay? Here we've got, uh, so, uh, the first argument is the string itself. The second is the index that you're looking for. That's what you're going to use to divide the string. Here we're using a period, okay? And uh, the number that's our argument three says uh, two things. If it's positive, uh, which is the normal case, uh, we begin from the left and we start to move to the to to the right, looking for uh, a certain occurrence of uh, the index string. Okay. If it's negative, well, we start from the right and we go backwards. So this negative two says the following thing: start on the right because it's a, a negative, and go back until you found the index string, which is a, a period, uh, until you found the second one. So let's say M-O-C period, that's one, H-C-A-R-U-M period, oh, that's two, okay? So that becomes the dividing line. So you get everything after it, so you get the right side of that, maroc.com, okay? Now, if that were a positive two, 
it would work uh, the other way. We would begin from the left, which is usually the way we, we pull strings apart, but sometimes we pull uh, things out of the right side. So you begin from the left, okay? That was a positive two. So you'd go, well, all the, uh, you know, the HTTP colon slash slash and then www uh, period. That's the first uh, period. That's not the divider. M-U-R-A-C-H, that's the second. That would be the divider if it was a positive two, in which case we would have gotten HTTP colon slash slash www dot Maroc. Okay, so the negative, start from the right side. A positive value in the third uh, argument here, start from the left. Okay, pretty cool. Um, I like that one. Let's look at length, okay? So here we're saying that we want to know the length of MySQL without any space uh, padding. And you can see that the result is a five. So it's only char uh, counting the characters that we give it. On the other hand, if we ask for length of a string that has MySQL padded with two spaces in the front and two spaces in the back, it's going to count the spaces too, and we're going to get, it's going to count the spaces also, and we're going to get nine. Okay? So everything gets uh, counted, even blanks. Okay, let's do locate. Okay, so here uh, with locate, we're going to locate the string SQL within a front padded my SQL. Okay, and it says that it's located at five. So let's see where five is. Blank one, blank two, three, four, five. So five is where the character string starts. Okay, again, uh, we're counting the positions in string starting with one. Uh, it, if you've always been doing it, what I call the hard way, starting with zero, like you would in uh, Python or Java or JavaScript, well, it's going to take some adjusting. On the other hand, I think it's much more intuitive. So that's how we got the five. Okay, the next one, we're locating the hyphen in this phone number, and it says it's in position 10. And let's just uh, confirm that. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine. Yes, it's in position 10. Very good. Okay. Now, um, there's a lot of things you can achieve by putting functions inside of functions. Okay. So it's uh, powerful. Um, it's exciting. Sometimes uh, confusing. Okay, so how do functions within functions work? Well, we execute them from the inside out. Okay, so here we say we want to do a replace. Okay, so we have a, uh, a character string. And then we say that we want to... Uh, we want to play, uh, we want to replace, I'm sorry, we're trying to, uh, what are we trying to replace? Yeah, so we've got uh, 13, I'm going to put you on hold because I think there's potentially an error here. Let me just pause you. No error, just hard to read. Okay, so on the inside, we have a write, and we have a string, and then we've got 13, and this write parent is part of write, okay? 
So we're taking the right 13 characters of uh, this. So let's see what this is. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. It's everything but the first uh, uh, paren, the left paren. Okay? So we take the right, okay? And then we're uh, then we're going to replace in that we're going to replace uh, a, a comma a spa I'm sorry I'm sorry we're going to uh, what are we going to replace uh, this is a mess this is why I really don't like things. Um, uh, so the next thing is, oh, I'm sorry. We're going to replace uh, the right uh, a paren and space with a hyphen. So what are we doing? Well, by doing the right part, we got rid of the left uh, paren. Okay. With the replace... We're taking this right paren uh, space, and we're replacing that with a hyphen. So we're getting all hyphens. Three characters, hyphen, three characters, hyphen, four characters. Okay? Now, that, I think, when you know how it works, is uh, great. Is that easy to read uh, code? No, I don't think it is. One of the things that I tell to uh, more beginning uh, programmers, and if we're working in a oh a more formal procedural kind of a language, uh, like the procedural parts of uh, Python or Java or uh, uh, Java script, is instead of uh, nesting these things inside each other, do the inside operation first and put it in a temporary variable name, and then do the outside operation on the temporary uh, uh, variable name. And sometimes that can read a lot uh, better. Now, we don't have that possibility in a language like SQL. So to the extent that we want to do a series of operations, uh, the only alternative we, that we really have is to embed functions within uh, functions. And the fact is, they only read so well. Okay? Um, I, I didn't like that one. It got the job done, though. Okay? Okay, let's look at insert. Okay? Um, we're looking at... We're trying to insert MySQL... Uh, and we're trying to insert it into um, a string that begins with, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's drives me crazy. MySQL is the beginning string in both of these examples, okay? So this is what we're working on. We're trying to insert this Marox into it. The difference between these two is that um, the first one has double quotes around Marox, so it's easy to have an apostrophe inside. If, in fact, we want to surround it by apostrophes, we can only get the real apostrophe in Marox, H apostrophe S, by putting two apostrophes in. Okay, uh, and we're saying here that we want to put it in uh, at the beginning, at uh, position one. Okay, that's how we're getting that done. All right. Okay, <laughs> apologize for the the ambiguities of that slide, but uh, I think it's about that hard to read. I don't really like the way it reads uh, 
uh, myself. But we all have to do it. I've got to suck it up and do it just like you. So let's look at a statement where we're using three different functions. Okay. So it's a select against the vendor's uh, table. We're looking for the vendor name. Okay. And then after that, we're going to we're going to uh, try to build a contact uh, name. So the first uh, thing that we do is we do this uh, concat uh, ws, which of course you know now is with separator. Okay, and we um, a, a very common. Um, value for uh, separators is a comma uh, space. So we're going to do vendor contact last name, and then the separator is going to show up, and then vendor contact first name. Uh, and you can see uh, as a contact name, so, so you can see that happening down in contact name. That's good. Uh, we didn't have any function associated with the first uh, column, so we just got the vendor name. And then we're saying uh, where the left uh, four digits of the vendor phone is uh, left paren 559. Okay. And um, then for the vendor phone field, what are we doing? While well, we're taking uh, the right. Uh, eight digits as a, a phone. So we're testing the left uh, four, okay? But we're showing the right eight, okay? Pretty cool. Okay, <clears throat> now this overlaps with uh, some of the things that we learned in previous uh, chapters. It just really supplements them. It doesn't contradict them, okay? Uh, we're, we're in a situation where uh, somebody uh, before us uh, has designed a database where uh, uh, we have a comp called emp ID. Let's, let's assume that that's employee ID and that name is employee name, okay? And uh, they defined emp ID as a string, okay? Now, when you sort string columns that have number values in them, they don't sort the way that you would like them to sort. So we get one and then one seven and then two and then two o oh, and then three. Uh, we would really like to get uh, one, then two, then three, then 17, then uh, 20. So how do we get that to happen? Well, we come up with a way to convert that string uh, field to a number field. Either that or to a two-digit string field that's been padded with zeros on the left. So we change it to 01 and 02 and 03. Then they sort the right way. Okay? So in the current example that we're seeing on slide 8, we're just seeing uh, the problem that we're trying to solve, that these are not showing up in the right order. Okay? Now, uh, here's an easy way to do it using a function we've already learned. We just say uh, order by, and we're going to cast emp ID as signed. So uh, signed is just a regular old int. Okay, and this uh, gets uh, turned into an int and sorted in the right order. Perfect. Very straightforward, well-documented. I like that version. Okay. Another thing, we've already seen a version of this before, is that you can actually convert uh, strings to numbers implicitly 
by saying uh, here order by amp ID plus zero. So when you use a string in an arithmetic expression, um, it will implicitly understand, oh, I had better convert that string part to a number. And then, of course, uh, we're only adding zero, so we're not changing the value. So this is a way to entice it to do an implicit conversion to a number. And as you can see here, we're getting the order that we want. So that's another way to solve that. Here's a third way to solve this. Okay, what we're doing is to say, okay, let's uh, let's not worry about the fact that it, it, it's a string. Let's just uh, patch up the string. Okay, if this was uh, if single digit numbers had a leading zero, uh, they would sort right as a string. So uh, what we do is we do an L pad, a left uh, a pad, employee ID, uh, pad it out to, to uh, two uh, character uh, positions, and uh, pad the blank uh, part of it with zeros, okay? So what's interesting here is that the uh, the short ones that were only one character long, they got padded with a leading zero. The ones that were two characters long to begin with, we didn't overlay character one with a zero. They stayed as they were. So 17 and 20 remained as they were. And 1, 2, and 3 became 01, 02, 03. And they sort just fine as character strings. Okay? So that's another way to solve that same use case. Okay. Now, we're about to start a... Uh, we're about to start an exercise that I think it's important to see how these string related functions work. Okay, so I think it's worthwhile exercise. On the other hand, I just want to point out that the situation that we're in here is a bad situation to start that looks like it came from um, uh, someone having coded the employee name ep, emp, uh, uh, name as uh, one column, okay? And as you've probably already seen throughout the course in the previous uh, chapters and the comments that I've uh, made, um, especially with respect to names, but also addresses and things like that, the way to do the design on the database is to disaggregate them and then uh, re-aggregate them in, in the query, in the select, with a concat, okay? And when you do that, you can get exactly what you want. But what if some fool uh, before you, you know, uh, if you have a database in which uh, somebody who lacks a lot of foresight has uh, put it in an aggregated person name, then how could you try to pull it apart again? Well, um, we're going to see uh, the author uh, try, okay? And we're going to learn how some of the functions work. Um, the conclusion uh, for me is that, well, you can get it to work pretty well, but uh, this is sure a good lesson in which... Uh, you learn that when you design your database, you ought to disaggregate the name parts or the address parts or the parts of anything that you would rather you uh, get back to the atomic uh, pieces because um, it's easier to aggregate than to try to disaggregate, as we'll see. Okay, so here's what we're trying to do. We have these names, okay? these employee names, and let's make them a little bigger so we can see them. Okay, so we've got Lisbeth Darian. That's a, a typical 
uh, Northern European uh, a name, uh, first name, space, last name. That's easy to pick apart. Darnell O'Sullivan, the same deal. It has an apostrophe in the O'Sullivan, but um, we seem to be able to pick that apart. Uh, Lance, Lance uh, Pino Potter, uh, hyphenated last name, but not too hard to get those uh, two hyphenated parts to stay together. Now, the last two examples are uh, tricky. We've got Jean-Paul Renard, okay? Jean-Paul probably thinks that his first name is Jean-Paul, okay? So, uh, 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 that uh, creates uh, some problems with the uh, disaggregation um, algorithm. And Alicia Von Strump probably believes that her last name is Von Strump, okay? Not Strump. Okay, so um, how does this uh, work? Well, we do a substring index. So we look for um, the index to, to pull out what we're looking for. Okay, so we use a space, all right? And in the first one, we use a positive one. So that means we take the first one on the left. That's how we get first name. And in the second one, we have a negative one. So we take the first one going from the right, and that's how we get the last name. But the problem is here that it's not easy. If you've been full enough uh, to aggregate the name when you stored it, um, you have a problem that you're not calling Jean-Paul Jean-Paul. And you, uh, you're not uh, catching the fact that Alicia's last name is Von Strump. Okay, cool. so uh, a problematic, but uh, better than nothing, perhaps. Okay, now let's see what we're doing. Um, uh, now we're realizing that we might have more than one space. Okay, so now we've got, uh, we're just uh, taking the names and we're trying to find the location of the first uh, space and the location of the second. And what we're seeing here is um, if we don't have a second space, it's going to come back as zero because we're doing this locate. Uh, and if we do, then we're going to have the we're going to have the index of uh, the first and the index of the second. Okay, and how do we get the first? Well, it's pretty easy. We use a locate, which works from the left side. So that's how, how we get the first one reliably. Okay, and then what do we do uh, uh, with the second one? Well, you we use a locate within a... a, a locate so what we're doing is that we're we're taking the right half of the name and we're uh we're doing the locate within uh that okay and that uh will work okay now this is going to help for our next strategy okay so now we're looking for uh, we're using the substring function and the locate function. And let's just look at the results first. The first three always seem to work, but the last two, uh, we've got Jean Paul Renard. That didn't work. But we did find for Alicia Von Strump. That caught the fact that her last name was uh, Von Strump. So again, I can't emphasize enough Never get yourself into this fix if you're driving the car. If you're driving the car, never create a column that has this pre-aggregated person name, okay? You will only regret it. And if some fool before you has already done it, well, these are good ideas and uh, uh, a chance to see how the functions uh, work, okay? So... Uh, so wants to take a substring, okay, 
of employee name one locate a space within the right part, okay? Uh, so in both cases, using a combination of substring and locate uh, to get um, the part of the string that he wants. And again, it's not a perfect solution. Okay, and that's where we're stuck. Okay, so the, uh, the fact is, is that you can do a lot of fancy stuff to disaggregate the name parts that have been stored as aggregated. But I think the real lesson to take away from this, apart from how can you nest functions inside e each other to get more power. But the, uh, the real lesson is don't do a design where you store aggregated uh, uh, person names or aggregated addresses or some similar thing. Store them in their atomic uh, parts and uh, use uh, concat or uh, concat with a separator to get them looking like you would like to have them. Okay. All right. Numbers. So what are some of the numeric functions? Uh, let's go back to the regular size. Okay. Yeah, looks like the regular size. Uh, round, truncate, ceiling, floor, absolute values, uh, absolute value, sign, square root, power, and rand for getting a random value. Okay. Let's see how they work. So rounding, okay, if we say that we want just want to round on number or we say that we want to round comma zero, so this uh, comma zero is optional, okay, if we just want to round something to whole numbers, then we can leave off the comma zero. Or if we say comma zero explicitly, we're going to go from 12.49 to 12, or 12.5 is going to round up to 13, okay? If we say we want to round 12.49 to one digits, well, then it's going to round uh, the first uh, digit up from a 4 to a 5 because the next position is a 0.9, okay? So rounding works about the way you think it would. We've already used it a couple times. The truncate is uh, uh, just lopping off the fractional part, okay? Uh, so if we say that we want to truncate 12.51 to zero decimal uh, digits, well, we're just going to lop off the 5.1. Um, the word uh, truncate, can't you think, uh, you just, it's like cutting the trunk of a tree. <laughs> You're just lopping it off. So in, instead of rounding up to 13 like we did above, we're, uh, we're going, uh, we're only getting the first uh, two digits, which gives us a 12, okay? You don't have to do it at, at, the, at the whole number point. You can do it at a decimal uh, digit point. So here when we truncate 12.49 to one decimal uh, digit, uh, we get 12.4. Again, if we were rounding, it would have been 12.5 as we see up um, above. But when you truncate, you're just lopping it off. No, no rounding uh, involved. Okay. Okay. What's the ceiling? Well, the ceiling uh, works... Um, maybe a little different than you might imagine, okay? So when we think of a ceiling, we think of the top, okay? The ceiling in a room is the top of our room, right? So, okay, that kind of makes uh, sense. Now, um, and it makes a lot of sense on the positive side of the number line. So for the positive uh, values, you won't be surprised if you take the ceiling of a positive 12.5, you get 13, okay? It's up higher. It's the ceiling, okay? However, if you take a ceiling of a negative 
uh, 5, you get a negative 12. And uh, you ought to be thinking of this as being on the number line, okay? So we have a number line. You can almost think of uh, two rulers, okay? One turned the wrong way on the left side, so you can see the negative values uh, going away. And then, uh, so you, you know, you look on the number line and you might have fractional values, but if you want to go to a whole value, you take the ceiling. And of course, uh, it's pretty easy on the positive side. Well, the ceiling is the one to the right. Well, on the negative uh, number line, it's also the one to the right. Okay, so it's not higher in the sense of magnitude. Okay, if it's higher in terms of magnitude, then it would be a negative uh, 13. It's higher in the sense that it's always on the right side of the number line. So it goes up to the next whole number on the right side of the number line. And in the case of a negative uh, 12.5, uh, that's negative 12. Okay, so that's how I try to envision it to remember it. The floor is going to be the left side of the number line, okay? Uh, just opposite. So if, we're, uh, if we've got a negative 12.5, then we're going to go over to the left side of the number line there. We're going to get a negative 13. If we've got uh, a positive 12.5, then we're going to go to the left side on the number line. It's going to be a positive uh, 12. The absolute value is just going to uh, disregard the sign. So if you have a negative 1.25, it'll give you a positive 1.25. Uh, if you, you have a positive 1.25, uh, you'll still have a positive 1.25. What if you just want to figure out what the sign of your value is? Well, the sine function will return a negative one if it has a negative sign and a positive one if it has a positive sign. Okay? Uh, it's square roots. Most of us uh, remember uh, square roots. So uh, the square root of 125 and change is 11 and change. Okay? And let's think about that. Uh, the square of 11 would be uh, 121, I think. And the square of 12 would be 144. So uh, this, uh, this is going to be uh, in between 121 and 144, closer to 121. So it's close to 11. Works uh, fine. Uh, how do we raise numbers to a power? Okay, for instance, to square them. So uh, the, the, the function is power. The first argument is the number that we want to raise to the power. And the second argument is uh, the power. So 9 to the second power or 9 squared is 81. Okay. And RAND will give us a random value between 0 and 1, OK? This is a way for us to, uh, oh, what I, I used to do a lot when I had to pick students in a certain order uh, is I'd give them a random value. So I'd get a number between uh, 0 and 1, and I would sort on that. Um, and that would be like uh, picking uh, numbers out of a hat. Okay. Where are we? Okay. <clears throat> now, here's another example of a problem. Um, you know, just as uh, remember, we had that problem where we had the column uh, that was. Um, uh, we had a primary key. The employee ID was uh, character one and uh, was a character column instead of a number column. 
And we, we found a couple of ways around that problem. Well, another problem that happens is that these, these float uh, values are not exact uh, values. They're approximate, okay? And that makes it really hard when we're trying to either include or exclude them. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, we have a float sample table in which we have, uh, we've got a lot of values around one. The first three values are all around one. Okay, but uh, the first one is just a tiny bit less than one. The second one's exactly one. The third one is a tiny bit more than one. If we do a select and we say where float value equal one, we're only going to get the one that's exact. Now, if that's what you want, that's great. But more typically, you're looking for values that are um, that you would uh, consider equal to one, even though they're they're off by uh, very small rounding amounts. Okay, so we're going to learn how to solve this problem. Okay, so we can do it where we can just say where float value between 0.99 and 1.01. Okay, uh, and that's going to get us all three values. Um, as the values appear. Or we can say where float value rounded to two decimal uh, places equals 1.00. The nice thing here is uh, maybe these float values are supposed to represent dollars and cents, okay? Uh, and so we want to make sure if we round to just the level of dollars and cents that they're all uh, considered... Uh, uh, equal to the value that we're looking for, um, $1 and zero, zero cents. Okay, so that'll work as well. Okay, that's all we had with that. All right, now the dates, okay? We've already used the dates. I think we even had an exercise for homework where we use some of the date uh, functionality and even before we had covered it. Uh, so now we're officially uh, covering it. So what what the versions have we got here? Well, we've got uh, now, sys date, current time stamp, cur date, current date, cur time, current time, UTC date, UTC uh, time. Okay. Now, I want to point out here on this slide uh, 20, that of all these things that we see here now, the ones that are part of the SQL standard, okay, that are not proprietary to my SQL, okay, and, and the proprietary things might not only be proprietary to my SQL, they may be sort of a general uh, naming scheme that's used in a couple of SQL implementations. But the only ones that you're sure to find are the ones that are in the standard, and they are current timestamp. That's the equivalent of now. Current date is just the date, and current time is just the time. Okay, so these are the values from the standard if you want to stick to uh, the SQL standard. And how does it help you? Well, if you want to move from database management system to database management system, it's going to make a whole lot easier to port your code because um, if, in fact, you're using uh, some of the values up here and they're not supported in the database management system that you're going to, well, then you're going to have to go and change some of your queries. Okay, now these uh, top uh, one, two, three groupings are part of, uh, I guess there are really only two groupings, are part of my SQL's uh, more proprietary uh, features. So now we'll get you uh, the date and the time. That would be the equivalent of current timestamp. 
sys date will give you the date and the time. That would also be the equivalent of current timestamp. Cur date will get you the date. That would be the same as current date. Cur time will get you the time. That would be the same as uh, current time. And UTC date and UTC time will get you uh, Greenwich, the date and the time at, at uh, on the zero um, meridian at uh, Greenwich, England. Okay, now there are a bunch of date time parsing functions that are pretty powerful and cool. I think we may have seen some of the formatting stuff. I think we saw the formatting stuff, not the parsing stuff, but uh, here we're going to see uh, some pretty cool parsing stuff. So we've got a uh, day of month, month, year, hour, minute, second day of week. Uh, and these work with either dates or times. And we can get the quarter, the day of year, the week of the year, the last day of the month, the day name, the month name. Okay, that's like uh, Thursday and September. So let's look at these. So uh, again, we've got these literal dates, okay, uh, or literal times. Uh, more typically in our day job, we would be doing this with a column name. So we can pick out the day of the month, uh, the month, the four digit year, the two digit hour, the two-digit minute, the second, here we just get the value. Uh, so it starts as uh, two digits, but zero is only going to come back as uh, zero. Uh, the day of the week, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the number of the quarter, this is a December date. It's in the fourth uh, quarter. The day of the year, this is uh, day number 337. The week of the year, this is in week number 48. Uh, and the last day uh, will give you the last day of the month. So you can tell uh, how many days are in that month. Okay, this is uh, particularly helpful for months like uh, February, where we don't know the last day of the month unless we know what the year is. Whoa, that got away from me. Uh, the day name. This is a Monday, the month name. This is uh, December. Okay, another thing that we can do is we can use the extract function, which is maybe more general. So we say extract unit from, and then we give it some kind of a date value or column that's holding a date uh, time value. So what can we extract? The second, the minute, the hour, the day, the month, the year, the minute second, okay, which will give you minutes and seconds, hour, minute, day, hour, year, month, hour, second, day, minute, day, second, okay? So um, there's a lot of things here. You ought to be able to find what you need. Okay, and here are examples uh these leading ones where we get the second the minute the hour the day the month the year they're all pretty straightforward um if you really want to understand what uh the things like day minute uh get you um you'll see that from um This uh, gives you the number of the day, day 311. Uh, no, what does it? This is uh, 1203, day, hour. Let's just think of that.
Where's day? This is day three of the week. So this is day three of the week. Okay, that's where three is uh, coming from. Uh, 11 is the hour and 35 is the minutes. Okay. So again, I don't really get a lot of use cases for these, but uh, that it's really all here. It's really only for me when you get into these kind of combination things that you have to really think about what you're getting and how is it likely to be expressed. Uh, two formats, uh, two functions, uh, one for formatting dates and one for formatting time. We've, we've already seen these. I think we saw these in a pretty early uh, chapter. And again, the only, um, the only challenging aspect to this is just the format uh, string. Okay. Now, uh, you can extract. So, um, uh, again, uh, how, how do you remember these? Well, I look them up, okay? More typically, what I do is I copy them from a solution that I already have. Uh, typically, your user group is going to be interested in a particular expression of the date or the time, and you're always going to be doing it the same way. So you're going to have to hunt for the format uh, characters uh, when you do it the first time, but once you get it to work, well, then you'll probably be copying and pasting. M more codes on slide 26. Uh, and just some examples of the way that they work. Okay. And again, I'm going to leave those for you to read. Okay, now these uh, functions, the date manipulation functions, are, are cool. Okay, uh, what's the use case? Well, um, when you're either paying or you're getting paid, or when you're shipping things or having things shipped to you, um, what you want to know is uh, have things happened with in an allowable interval, okay? Which means, uh, should you escalate the process? Is it time for the angry phone call? Is it time for the nasty letter, right? So what you're often doing is you're trying to compare uh, the actual date or the projected date to some kind of standard to see how far away you are from that. And again, uh, are you are you okay? In which case, you're probably not going to uh, make the angry phone call or send the nasty letter. Or are you are you damn mad and you're gonna make the angry phone call or send the nasty letter? So that's that's the use case. We have a date add, a date sub, uh, a date diff a two days and uh, a time to uh, second. Okay, so these are all ways to do uh, conversions with with uh, dates and times. Okay, so I want to point out here, here we're looking at date add and date uh, sub, okay? And what's interesting is because you can date add negative uh, days or, 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 or months or uh, seconds or whatever, a negative interval, okay? Do you really need to use a date sub? No, it might be better documentation though, don't you think? Okay, so um, uh, theoretically, because we can use negative uh, uh, values for the it date add intervals, we didn't really need the date sub anyway, okay? But again, it's maybe better documentation if what you're really doing all the time is uh, subtracting. All right, so let's see. Uh, we can add the interval of one day, three months, one second, 
negative, here we're adding a negative one day. Here we're subtracting one day. Interesting that they turn out to be the same value. Okay. Uh, here we're adding one year. Now, what's interesting here is when you add a year, it's sophisticated enough that you're going from the last day of uh, February 2016 uh, to the last day of uh, February 2017. And um, it turns out that uh, February in 2017 only has 28 days. Whereas in 2016, it had 29 days, but it's smart enough when you add a year that it just goes to the last day of uh, February. I think that's pretty cool. Now, here's a, a situation where we're trying to add an interval of one year to an invalid uh, date. 2018-02-29 is an invalid date. So it just gives us a crummy answer, no. Um, and here we're adding a day hours. So we're adding uh, uh, two days and 12 hours. Okay, so lots of possibilities uh, here. A date uh, diff, okay. Uh, you've got uh, two dates. Uh, again, they're literals here, but they probably would be... Uh, uh, column names, and you're getting um, the difference. Now, of course, the order that you put them in is going to uh, tell you uh, whether you're going to be expecting a positive or negative uh, value. You probably want to do a little testing uh, to make sure that you know what you're expecting. Okay. Uh, there's a two days. And there's a uh, time to sec. Okay. Okay. I think we've gone. I don't know if we went to the right place or the wrong place. We did. Here we go. Okay. So now uh, we're going to have some more. Uh, disappointment. We had the disappointment with uh, the floating point numbers not behaving the way that we hoped that they would. We had the disappointment with the uh, numbers expressed as strings not expecting the way we thought they would. And it turns out that there are some aspects of both dates and times that don't really behave the way we expect them to, them to in queries. So we're going to go over some of these edge cases here so you're sure to do the right things in your queries, okay? So um, here we've got uh, date times, okay? And there's uh, quite a few of them that are on 228, uh, well, this one in 2018, 2019. Uh, we've got uh, a bunch of different uh, date times. Okay, so uh, here we're saying that we want to uh, select all the roads from the date sample table where the start date is equal to 2018-02-28. Uh, and you would expect to get, uh, let's see, row uh, 2, uh, row 4, row 5, and what do you get? You get nothing. Okay, why is that? Well, because you have a date time uh, field on your hands. And since you didn't specify anything with regard to the time, uh, it's not going to match. Now, I think that's very disappointing, but that's the way it works. Okay, what's the fix up? Okay, well, one way to fix it up is to say, I want everything beginning with uh, the the date equal to 228, uh, uh, beginning uh, everything greater than or equal to that and less than the next day, 0301. Okay. So uh, 
that's going to get you uh, 10 o'clock on 02 uh, 28. Okay. I thought we had some other 02 28s. 02 28. Uh, yeah, we do. I don't know why we didn't get those. Well, and then uh, I think better documentation is uh, you can use the functions. So we would say we're month of, of the start date equal two and day of the start date equal 28 and year of the start date equal 2018. And we can see here that we've got uh, another row here. So we got row four. Okay, so I think this is great that we got row four. Um, but I've got to tell you, I don't, oh, uh, okay. So row two is in 2016. Oh, row five is in 2019. So it really is only row four. And uh, we had other two uh, 28s, but they're in two different, years you gotta you gotta be really looking at the details so let me make this a little bigger so we can see it so there really is only one road that uh, satisfies so it's a little too small to read well i guess okay so it's only row four that we were hoping to get okay and now when we go to the next row and uh to the next uh slide and we we do one of these two alternatives to catch it. Uh, we catch the single row, row uh, four. Okay, I'm satisfied. Now, um, personally, I like the documentation of the second version. Okay, there's, there's no trickiness uh, to it. All right, so I really like that. Do they both work? Yeah, they both work just fine. Okay. Uh, here's another one. Um, and we've seen kind of similar solutions to something like this in other uh, chapters. What you can do is you can simply uh, format the date the way that you'd like, and then uh, compare it to the character string that you're looking for when you format it. I think that's good documentation as well. So again, I like uh, version three. I liked version two. Version one, I'd like the least. But again, all three work. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> you won't be too surprised to find out we've got the same problem with uh, times. So we're looking for, uh, we're looking to match 10 o'clock. That would be 10 a.m because this is a 24 hour time. And again, I'll make this a little bit bigger so I don't get confused on, on this one. We've only got one row that's at 10 a.m. Again, that's row number four, okay? So we're like, we were hoping to get row number four, but we didn't. So what do we really have to do to bring back row number four? Well, here's what we have to do. Uh, we can do, uh, kind of the thing that we talked about, uh, was kind of the last, uh, solution that we showed for the dates is, uh, is to format it in a particular format and then compare it to the string you're expecting to get back. That works great. Uh, or we could extract the hour second from, uh, the start date. So we get, uh, we get, uh, one zero for the hour, zero zero for the minute, zero zero for the second. That's going to give us a good answer as well. So I think those are both good. Um, so uh, what if we wanted to search for an hour of the day? Okay, so we could say, uh, where the hour of the start date equal nine. That works uh, pretty well. Okay, or then we could say, what if we wanted a range of times between 9 a.m. and noon? Well, we could do that by getting the hour minute. 
Okay, so there's lots of possibilities there. Um, just a heads up that when you're dealing with these uh, date times, uh, that you've got to be careful. Uh, they may not. Uh, they may not respond uh, to where clauses uh, in uh, in the way that you naively would think that they do. The case. Now, the case is such a super statement. There, there are two versions of it. Okay, uh, we've had a bunch of. Oh, geez, we go all the way back to the, um, I, I think, chapter three. We had a situation where we were trying to categorize things. And we did it by using a, a literal and a column and a where clause. And we had more than one query and we union them uh, together. Uh, that's kind of categorizing rows the hard way. Uh, what's the easy way to categorize a row? Well, with the case uh, statement, okay? So the easiest version of case is when it's based upon a single uh, column, okay? So we, I guess we call this a simple case uh, function. So we say uh, select invoice number terms ID case of terms ID. And then we say when value, when you know, the value of terms ID is one, then we want to display this string, net to 10 days, when two, net to 20 days, when three, net to 30 days, etc. Okay. Um, so what do I like about this and what don't I like? Okay, well, what I don't like about this is um, uh, we've got, couldn't we just uh, simply do this with a lookup table? Yeah, we could. And I think that would be the more relational way to do it. The more relational way to do this is uh, we probably have a terms uh, table, okay? And these terms IDs that we're checking for are probably the primary keys of the terms ID uh, table. I would feel better if we had taken that and because uh, we're really not uh, classifying. What we're doing is we're interpreting a column uh, here, right? And uh, uh, we should have just uh, done that, in my mind, with a, uh, with a join. Okay, so uh, this I think shows us a lot about uh, how to use this, but I don't think this is a good use case. What's a good use case? Well, uh, one of one of the things I, I like if we look up here in the in the syntax uh, diagram, you can see that there's an optional else. Okay. Now, uh, there is a uh, part on our final project that we have a, we have a Boolean uh, field. I think it's whether or not a person can swim. Uh, and I think it's called is swimmer. Okay. And it's stored in uh, a Boolean uh, column. And uh, Boolean is an alias for... Uh, uh, tiny int. That's a one digit wide uh, int uh, column. And we're going to be populating it with uh, zeros and ones. Okay. Now, um, I could see uh, in somebody else's implementation, uh, maybe we could also have a null there. Like maybe we don't know whether they can swim or not. Okay, so for instance, in that case, uh, we would say when uh, zero, then uh, false, when one, then uh, true, else, uh, illegal value, or uh, 
No, oh, that's true. Sometimes it's going to be none, right? Uh, sometimes uh, we don't know. Uh, so we would say uh, uh, not specified, uh, something like that. Okay? So we could do that. Now that is, uh, we don't have, we don't have a lookup table for that. Okay, and usually wouldn't have a lookup table for uh, that. So that I think would be a better use of the simple uh, case. Okay, and that's a, 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 that's how you're gonna uh, you're gonna interpret the values of is a swimmer when you get to the uh, final project. All right. Now we have uh, so the one that's uh, more powerful is called a search case uh, function. Now, remember, if you just go back to the one that we just did, uh, it's based upon some input expression. Okay, so that could be a column or it could be an expression that includes one column or multiple uh, columns, okay? Uh, so uh, that's pretty powerful, but the next one, is even more powerful because we just say when conditional expression one, then result expression one. When conditional expression two, then result expression two. Now, do these all have to deal with the same uh, um, uh, columns? No, they don't. So, and then you have an optional else. So you can have a really sophisticated analysis uh, here, you're doing the same thing on the basis of the conditions you're coming up with a single value uh, to put in that column. But uh, because of the fact that it's not all based on one evaluated expression, but it could be a different one for each when, um, it can be even more sophisticated. So let's take a look at one of those. So we say, so we're looking at uh, the invoices uh, table, and we're trying to do, we're trying to uh, categorize invoices as into three categories: over thirty days past due, one to thirty days past due, or a current. That means that it hasn't, it's not uh, past due. Okay, we're not overdue. Okay, good. So when we say when, uh, it, it date diff of now, an invoice if it due date is greater than 30, then over 30 days past due. When date diff now, uh, an invoice uh, due date is greater than zero, then one to 30. How do we know it's one to 30? Well, because we got past the first one. Okay, we got past the first one where we pulled off all the cases that were greater than 30. Okay, so we know it's not greater than 30. Okay, um, and if we say it's greater than zero, eh, we're kind of rounding up when we say one. Well, that's not true because these are going to come back as integers. So uh, I might have said uh, greater than or equal to one. That might be a better uh, documentation. So now this is one to 30. Now else uh, current, how do we know it's current? Well, because it wasn't more than 30 days past due. It wasn't one to 30 days past due. And whatever drops through is not past due. It's current. Okay, so again, it, this is a great uh, a great way to categorize invoices as being a uh, uh, past due, and you could even have a uh, uh, kind of ranges of past due. And of course, we have the where. We're only going to look at the rows where uh, we owe something. So if, if the current uh, balance is greater than zero, then we're going to consider them. If it's zero or less, then we're not even going to consider it.
excuse me. Okay, good. Pretty cool stuff. Hold on one second. Okay. The if. Okay, so the if is a uh, similar functionality. Okay. Uh, however, um, uh, it is a little bit less powerful than a simple uh, case. Okay. Because we're always uh, testing the same expression. Okay. We only have one uh, test. Okay, whereas in the searched uh, case, we can have a different test for each uh, thing we're going to pick out. And uh, we can only have two possible result uh, values. Uh, the one where we pass the test and the one where we fail it. So this kind of an if is uh, very popular in uh, computer languages. Uh, in some, it's officially called the ternary if. Ternary as in three, three part. Okay. So what are the three parts? Well, we've got the test and we've got the value if true and we've got the value if false. Okay. So for instance, uh, let's say that we wanted to use this for our is a swimmer uh, case in uh, our final project. Okay, I don't remember whether we can have a null in that column or not. But it, if we couldn't have a null, and if we're absolutely sure that we're either going to get a uh, a zero or one on the basis of the way we define the database. Then we could use a ternary, uh, uh, the uh, uh, ternary F. Okay, so um, we could test it being equal to one, uh, and uh, if it's equal to one, it's uh, true they're a swimmer, and if it's not, there uh, it's uh, false. And here they said if the vendor city is equal to Fresno, then yes. Otherwise, no. And so they had, uh, they call this uh, column is city uh, uh, Fresno. Okay, so not as powerful as even the simple case, but there are a lot of cases where uh, you know you're controlling the values. Um, and this is a, a really quick way to interpret the values. Again, I would not use this um in order to uh, uh to avoid a lookup table that i already have if i have a lookup table for this if these uh, values are pointing to um if they're uh, foreign keys and they point to rows in a lookup table then just do a join okay that's the more uh relational way but if this is a if this is a column that is not a foreign key uh, and doesn't point to a row in a lookup table, while well, the simplest way to interpret it is with an if, then you would probably go to the simple case. And after that, you would probably go to the search case. Okay. If null, all right, so uh, we say if null test expression replacement value. So it, it's hard to catch a null in an if, okay? Uh, but you can catch a, a null with an if null, okay? So here we go, we're trying to interpret payment date and in this part of our database, we know if it has a payment date, it's been paid. If not, it hasn't been paid. Uh, so we say if null, uh, then, so how do we do this? Well, if it's not null, uh, uh, we use the uh, column. If it is null, we, 
I'm, I'm sorry, we use that column value. If it is null, we use this no payment string, right? So uh, here we've got the new date. This is the one. So the first one is uh, not null. So we use the actual uh, date from the payment date column. If it is null, then we say no payment. Again, it's not null, so we use the date from the payment date column. Okay, so that's a way to deal with these interpretive issues uh, when we're dealing with nulls. All right, and you might think, well, that's pretty sophisticated. There's another version that's even more sophisticated. It's called Coalesce. And um, it can have more values, okay? So how does that work? Well, you can see that we've got expression one, optional expression two, and then dot, dot, dot. So we can have a bunch of them. So what happens is that we take the first value uh, for that's not null, okay? So let's look at this. We say we want to coalesce the payment date, and then we want to say uh, the next one is no payment. So it looks at payment date. If it's not null, it uses it. It looks at no payment string. It's not null, so it uses it. So this gives us the same answers, but it would be more powerful if we had a series of oh, two or three or four uh, columns that we were checking, and then the last was, say, no payment, okay? In the current, with the current set of data, the coalesce does pretty much the same thing as the if null. And they're about the same uh, number of characters and uh, number of arguments and the whole thing. The real power of the coalesce is if you've got something that is a sophisticated enough situation that you're not just uh, checking a single column, perhaps you're checking uh, two or three columns. You know exactly what the circumstances of that would be, I don't know. Okay, and again, with the facts that we have here, there's really no difference in uh, the functionality that we get from if null and uh, coalesce. So those are the, that's the traditional uh, content for uh, chapter nine. And um, so I'm gonna break here. This is the end of part one for the lecture. In part two, we're gonna talk about uh, the new content for uh, chapter nine. So uh, please uh, join me for that next time. Bye-bye.